What if you could converse and connect more easily, authentically, and meaningfully? Well, good news is you're in the right spot. Hello and welcome to Enjoying Better Conversations. My name is Roger Corville, and welcome to another episode of Thought Leader Conversations, sponsored by Virtual Venues, the crew with 163 years of experience in helping you uniquely, and I mean uniquely, find value in virtual and hybrid event production partner. But today's not about us and I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage someone I know is brilliant because I've known her for years from our professional community, shared professional community at the National Speakers Association, Chief Connector and Conversation Whisperer, Patty DiNucci, award-winning author, speaker, facilitator, and author of a couple books, including one that's brand new that we're here to talk about today called More Than Just Talk, The Essential Guide for Anyone Who Wants to Have a Better Conversation. Welcome, Patty. I think I... Messed up the title of your book, didn't I? Uh, I don't know. I still mess it up because I'm getting used to it. You know <laughs> More what? than just talk. We got that part right. Unless this is somebody's first episode, uh, they figure out we're kind of a keeping it real crew <laughs> around here anyway. Because um, they can go anywhere and get polished. that's fake. So right. you, you know what that's called? Making a mistake and, you know, making people love you because of it. It's called, I just learned this like minutes ago. It's called the Pratt fall effect. When oh, we screw up, we're automatically more likable. <laughs> interesting yeah well so there you go scrap the opening question uh tell us who you are and what you do and then we're going to talk about the the pratt deadfall or whatever you just (laughs) called it well i'm patty danucci and i am an author a a two-time author um a speaker a consultant a workshop facilitator i love coffee i love an occasional glass of wine i love dogs i grew up in an mining town in northern Minnesota, uh, but now live in Austin, Texas. I've been here for a long time. I'm not going to say the year because then you'll start doing the calculations and you'll know how old I am. Um, I work at home. I um, have been working on this new book for probably more than eight years because, you know, I initially thought, oh, this will be just a little prequel to my other book, The Intentional Networker. How hard can it be? And I was wrong. It was fascinating (laughs) a lot more to conversation than you think so since we already threw out that teaser let's talk about that principle of being likable and i'm not going to put you on the spot as an expert here like you're an expert on other stuff but what was it called again uh the pratt fall effect you know like in a comedy somebody just like the oh. dick van dyke well people are people who are listening probably aren't old enough to know who dick van dyke is but you know walk into a room and you just fall down and people love you they laugh and they think that's hilarious <laughs> or you spill a cup of coffee on yourself in a meeting and suddenly you know the tension in the room is gone because hey someone just spilled coffee how much worse can it get right <laughs> not that we need to do these things on purpose for effect but um you know being an being uh, imperfect, being authentic and vulnerable and human makes us very likable. I mean, you, you talk about likability and, you know, I have, I, I wrote about that in the book. I mean, what is likability? And I know there are people that don't care if people like them, but I care. I, a lot, a lot of good things happen in your life if you're likable, not a doormat, but endearing, human, fun, funny. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I think if anything, and I know you've no doubt seen the research, particularly since COVID, but even before Mm -hmm. loneliness is at an epidemic level, right? And we don't have to look too far. I'm not telling anybody anything, anybody, anything they don't already know to know. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time talking at people instead of talking with them. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, Just just in this last week, I saw that the longest longitudinal study, you've probably seen this, right? Mm-hmm. Longest longitudinal study in the history of academia, at least here in the States, mm-hmm. was from Harvard. Yep. Looking at what it takes to be happy. Yeah, and that's been like an eight decade, 85 year study. They've been following the same people. You know, they have different groups that they've followed. And by and large, the the predictor of a happy life, of a healthy life, of a successful life, and a vibrant life, you know, that's just worth living is 
socializing and relationships and, you know, not just keeping that same circle of friends you've known your whole life, but also expanding out into being willing to talk to people that you don't know or making new friends. Yeah, that is a very compelling study. And, you know, you talked about the pandemic and us being lonely. Um, there's another wonderful writer named Ruth Whitman. She's British, but I think she still lives here in the United States. She's written extensively about how lonely and anxious people are in America because they have this rugged sense of individualism and, oh, I can afford to live alone and, you know, all that. And I learned, I'd mentioned Austin, Texas. That's where I live. Austin is one of the top loneliest cities in the United States. Wow. Which I can hardly believe because it's always been such a fun party town. Young people are here, all of that. But um, people are living alone. People are eating alone and working at home now, um, which I've worked at home since 1989, but I purposefully pick up the phone, make coffee appointments, go have happy hour or a, or a lunch or something with my colleagues. I've known since way back then that uh, if I don't get out of the house, <laughs> first of all, my work suffers, but my mental health will suffer too. Right. Yeah. And I think it's useful to, being careful here, but make that assumption about people when you talk to them, right? Everybody's got some oh, yeah. kind of junk going on in their life, if not some place where they wish they were more connected. Um, mm -hmm. So let's maybe transition to your book, because I know you've got a few things to say about that. In fact, I, I love how it opens. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the advanced digital copy. I wish you to, bet. I could tell you that I got the whole thing read in the last few days, but, um, but thank you. I love that you make the case that every task is easier with the right tools. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Saying that anyone can enjoy better conversations is simply a matter of learning the tools of master communicators. So what were you observing? Just out of curiosity, why this book? What were you observing in the world that led you here? Um, well, you know, my first book was The Intentional Networker, which is all about networking better as opposed to networking more. I, I come from a place of being an ambivert, which means I'm half extrovert and I'm half introvert and almost exactly half. And so I need the socializing and then I hit the wall and I'm done and I need my quiet time, my creative time, my writing time, my staring off, <laughs> staring at the birds and the trees time. Uh, so I come from a place of understanding that introverts exist and we should honor them because I feel that way. I feel introverted half of the time. Um, but what I was finding was when I was presenting, when I would run into people who read my book, you know, questions people ask me via email and social media, people were still wondering, like, yeah, I know the network, you know, the networking, you make a great case, I've learned some great things, but what about the conversation? How do I start the conversation? How do I keep the conversation going, keep it from being awkward? What, and the big question was, what do I say? What do I say? Mm. Okay, so given the title of the book, you'll, you'll never guess what I discovered in all my research. It's not necessarily about what you say in a conversation. Certainly it is. But the other two really important things are, what can you ask? Mm. Like the back of my book, there's an appendix back there. I don't know if you got that far back there, but there's a, an appendix, which listeners can get for free off my website, and we'll tell them how to do that later. But it's conversation starting questions grouped by setting sample settings like at a wedding or a social event at a networking mixer at the gym at the dog park at the grocery store wherever what can you ask someone to just start a light-hearted conversation and you know there's science that tells us that those daily conversations with perfect strangers or with just acquaintances neighbors your barista, your dry cleaning person, those give us little bursts of oxytocin. That's the tend and befriend hormone. And that chemistry makes us feel good, but it doesn't last very long. You know, compared to cortisol and the stress hormones that are just there all the time, we need these little bursts of the positive. And the pandemic proved that when people literally locked themselves up, people got depressed. And people were doing, people were locking themselves up on purpose prior to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, people say, oh, well, we're not supposed to talk to strangers. I don't know. That, I'll never see that person ever again. Mm, don't be so sure. <laughs> we you need know, this. Yeah, I know. And I, I just realized that I, I, it was convicting to kind of just 
look through some of your stuff, particularly since we haven't talked in a good long time. Too many years. It, well, yeah, quite a, quite a long time. But at the same time, I was thinking the way that you're approaching this is that anyone can do it. And anyone who wants to. Uh, that's in the title. That was a very careful. I, I played with the title and ran it through these analyzers. And I finally found the words that that were what I wanted to say and that also um, supposedly light, light us up intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. So these exact words, anyone who wants to enjoy better conversation, I know there's people out there that just don't care. And you know, caring is a huge part of it. You know, there's a, an older gentleman that lives in my neighborhood that is a recluse and really isn't interested in engaging. He's just not. And I feel bad for him. He's a widower. I know he misses his wife, but um there's nothing, there seems to be nothing that we can do to get them out of that funk. So, I, well, yeah. you know what, that, that was kind of the angle that I was going to ask you about next, particularly given your website is intentionalnetworker.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And, and at least one nuance of that particular Harvard study that we just spoke about was that it wasn't just about having conversations. It was about nurturing relationship, oh, right? There yeah. was an intentionality around it. Mm -hmm. And so to your point about, oh yeah, you've got to want to. Now, mm -hmm. to be fair, I mean, I'm kind of like you, ambivert, and I don't go to parties for fun. Talk about some of the benefits. I mean, okay. I presume anyone can benefit, but besides a shot of oxytocin, you mentioned mm -hmm physical, spiritual, mental, talk about why somebody might want to like, like work on it, their own skill. Yeah. Yeah. And surely, you know, I don't say yes to every party that we're invited to or every invitation or every meeting, networking meeting. I'm very selective because I think what else could I be doing or who, who else do I need to see that I haven't seen in a long time that is in my close circle? Like, do I need to be making more new friends and new contacts or do I need to be nurturing the relationships I already have? And I try to strike that balance. All that said, why would you want to go to a party or a networking event? I guess it depends on, you have to stop and think about that. Why do you want to go? Maybe you're new in a new city and you need to meet some new friends. Um, maybe you're going to an event, uh, you know, like going to one of our speakers events or a business event related to what we do. Um, I, like right now I have a new book out. I want to tell people about it. And it's not just about selling the book. It's I want to help people have better conversations. I truly want to get rid of the awkward and the, the contentious and the, the rude and the unbalanced. And, and by unbalanced, I mean, you know, you, you end up talking, to, talking, to, you end up listening to someone who just doesn't have any boundaries or barriers on um, how off, how much they dominate the conversation, which we, we can go down all kinds of rabbit trails here. Yeah. Um, which is what happened to me while I was researching this book. I would settle on one topic and I'd find three others that I had to, to cover. Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel. Yeah. Yes. I know, me yes. too. Well, no, I do the same thing. And, and I think if, well, I think, uh, you know, and, you know, so many of our listeners know I'm working on my doctorate in spiritual formation. Yeah. So I'm also thinking in terms of like, how can I help people? When you said that, mm -hmm. Uh, even before we actually pushed the record button, I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's the Patty I know. Mm, and thanks. but I think that might be a good question for someone to ask themselves. If I don't feel a sense of mission and meaning and purpose, because the research on my side of the fence shows that meaning and purpose, feeling that mm -hmm. sense of satisfaction has a lot to do, has everything to do with helping others. Right? Absolutely. So in fact, it's I, nice that yeah. we get something out of it, but yes. at the same time, real meaning and purpose is when I like maybe even put myself aside and and reach out and touch someone. Yes. How can I help somebody? Oh my gosh! I it seems like I always end up at a like at the a holiday party where, you know, people neighbors from down the street or people we know they have a party, and so not only am I getting to see the friends I know and the neighbors I know, but now I'm I'm exposed to their circle of friends, which you know, cool people usually know other cool people. 
And I often end up talking to someone, maybe it's, I don't know if you call it the bartender sy- syndrome or the pastor syndrome or, or what, but I often end up talking the to The bartending people, pastor syndrome. The bartending pastor <laughs> syndrome, <laughs> therapist syndrome. Um, I end up talking to people and, and they, they often say, oh my gosh, you just made my night. Talking to you was so refreshing. You're like, you're like salt where you just made something more delicious and oh my gosh that is the most beautiful thing anybody can ever say and i just i feel so good when that happens now i have to be careful about you know the drainers and the downers i have a whole section on that in my book the people that are just going to suck the life out of you so you have to be careful there you'll probably learn all kinds of things about that in a few years um you probably already know that now but you know serving people I, i was just having a conversation with my the house guests that I had here for several days. And we were talking about how when we were in our 20s, we were super ambitious. We thought we were super smart. We were just gotten out of school. We were super ambitious, ready to take on the world. 30s, we realized we didn't know as much as we thought we did. Right. (laughs) 40s, when we hit our 40s, for me, I discovered I needed more meaning in my work. I needed more meaning in my conversations. I needed just more meaning, period. And that's when I started reading more spiritual things, more self-help things. And then, you know, 50s kind of came along and there was more of that. But um, yeah, having some purpose and some meaning in our lives really improves our conversations too. Yeah, that's a that's an important two-way street. I had a similar journey. I mean, and it was in my 40s that I'm like, I, I remember setting a goal, you know, I mean, if you're listening to this, uh, again, thank you. And, but remember, Patty and I know each other from National Speakers Association for lots of years, and and it hasn't all been virtual, crazy enough. Mm-hmm. But but I remember setting a goal to be, I was, you know, at the peak of my, um, a particular era of that career, setting a goal to be known as the world's leading expert in blah, blah, ah. blah. Ten months later, I'm touring Australia, getting billed as blah, 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 right? Does that... Mm. You, and yet, at some point, there's a cost to that. Oh boy! And I just yeah. realized what what we all kind of figure out sooner or later, right? What's the old aphorism? Climb the ladder, but find out it's leaning against the wrong wall, and <laughs> it's kind of a lonely, <laughs> lonely place to be. Or it's broken. <laughs> it and, doesn't have uh, good footing. Mm. Yeah. So, but I sadly, it's I think. Cause I'm, I hope I'm more stubborn than the person listening to this because I hope they're smart enough to go buy your book and, and, <laughs> feel, oh, yeah. and, and get and yeah. say, Oh, wait a minute. I can make a change right here and right now. Mm-hmm. Patty, what obstacles do people run into? Oh boy, there's so many. Well, I mean, the obvious one is our technology. You know, to me, there's nothing sadder than going out to a restaurant and seeing an entire family or a group of friends all sitting around a, a table at a beautiful restaurant. Here they are together and they're all on their phones. And, and there are two words for that. One's called fubbing, phone snubbing. The other one's called, and this can apply to, you know, larger smart devices, technoference. You know, we, we have this illusion that we're connected I mean, this is an era where we feel like we feel like we're more connected than ever. And really, we're more isolated than ever. I mean, there is a survey out there that says that the majority of the people in the world don't feel like they have someone they can talk to about a problem. Right. Yeah. It's it's and the number I don't even remember. You probably remember the number. What do you it? Mm, And the number was like exceedingly low. It was. The data, I mean, the more I did the research on this, the more disturbing the data was. And, you know, it, and that's a great reason to, to, for all of us to start acknowledging each other. Like there's this thing called the hospitality rule. It's also called the 10, five rule. If you're within 10 feet of somebody, if you don't, maybe you don't know them, maybe it's in your office. Maybe, maybe it is someone that, you know, with, if you're in 10, within 10 feet, make eye contact and nod or give a little wave. If you're within five feet, look at them, say their name and offer a greeting like, hello, Roger, maybe throw in something. Hello, Roger. Good morning. How's your day going? Give them something. And granted, this doesn't work on the streets of New York City because that's just a highly, highly densely populated area. I mean, use your judgment on that. You know, don't be like uh, Will Ferrell and Elf (laughs) where he's just, hello, (laughs) everybody. I mean, obviously, but um, 
it's astonishing to me how often I can be at the gym or at a restaurant or the grocery store or something and someone will walk right I guess the grocery store would be a, not as good an example the gym someone will walk right by me and never make eye contact just blow right past me and I'm not I'm doing this more for the human study piece of it I just like how often does that happen how many people acknowledge others whether it's me or anybody how many people just bother to say good morning um, we have really been cruel to each other that way. And when we talk about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, can we start with just being courteous and friendly? Let's start right. there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hello, goodbye, please, and thank you. And I have a great story that's actually in my book. Um, my friend, John Langford, he's a photographer here in Austin. He grew up, his dad was a missionary. He grew up in, I think, Hong Kong or Singapore or something. And he learned great manners with being around all these different people. He went on a round-the-world trip when he turned 50 and he learned how to say hello goodbye please and thank you in every language or dialect that he was visiting and he said he had no problems whatsoever with people they were all welcoming friendly helpful kind and it was because he started with just the basics so if people say i have a hard time making friends start with hello goodbye please and thank you see what happens it's kind of basic well, but it's a good reminder. You know, mm -hmm. I think that even comes back to the being intentional piece, right? Because mm -hmm. it is yeah. just as easy to not say something sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Which, and we've all been there, if not heard the stories, you know, you sit down on the plane, you're, you, whether you want to read or sleep or whatever, and, you know, you put in your, mm -hmm. you put in your ear pods to, to, Avoid create, the person sitting next well, to you. Create a boundary. Yeah, and, and that's okay. I mean, we all get on the plane. Sometimes we're really tired or we're preparing for something we know is going to be really draining. And, and I think that's absolutely fine. But at least acknowledge your seatmate and say, hello, how are you doing? You know, we are humans. But I think sometimes people are afraid. What's going, going to happen if what, – right. what what's going to happen if I say hello to my seatmate are they going to talk my ear off the entire flight? I think we're a we've, we put up those boundaries. And you can even extend this to what happens if I get a roommate? Like, you know, if I wasn't here with my, my sweetie, if he wasn't living here with me, I'd probably have to have, I'd probably have a roommate just because I think it would get really isolating. Yeah. Um, but it would have to be the perfect roommate. <laughs> it would have to be a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, me I mean, crazy. If, if you knew, even if, if you were tired, if you knew that the person that you would, you were going to say something to was going to just be pleasant and they were going to breathe life into you, you probably would be a little less fearful about that, right? Yes, I imagine sometimes yes. we, we concerned either we don't have the time or, or we're going to get mm -hmm. stuck with or in a conversation with, mm -hmm. what did you call them? Downers and dumbasses? A drainer or? and a downer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, okay, so here's our responsibility as people. You know, a big thing, is, it seems so obvious, read the room, read the person's face. You know, it, let's say you're sitting on an airplane and let's say you have a tendency to want to talk to people. Let's say you're more extroverted and you love. Okay, can we be kind and follow a couple of rules? In any conversation, we listen 60% of the time. We talk only 40% of the time. We speak in 40 second increments. It's like, for example, I, I you know, I know I'm the guest on your show and I'm probably already blowing that that rule, but I'm trying to say what I have to say and take a break so that you can either follow up with, oh, tell me more or a different question. Like, can we not talk each other's ears off or launch into negative topics or launch into contentious topics or share things that are too intimate, too personal? Um, <laughs> we still... We still love, Mark and I still laugh about, there are two ladies behind us on a plane and one of them, I think she was on some sort of pain medication that was like messing up her inhibitions. And she started telling her seatmate things that we still laugh about. <laughs> 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 you know, and I'm not even gonna share because they're just too out there. But um, yeah, we we have the responsibility as the the seatmate to not only say hello to our, seatmates but also respect them and you know maybe you want to read your book if the person's reading their book and you're still talking to them 
you've missed a social cue there. They're trying to read their book or if they've popped their earbuds in, they want to listen to their podcast or their music. But, you know, maybe something might be missing there. If, if they do those things, they might be missing out on something you're going to share with them. We just have so much work to do here. Well, we do. And, you know, it comes back to want to or intent, right? Yeah. If, what, some people think they're better at it than they are mm -hmm. and, and don't think they have something to learn. In fact, curiously, one of the questions that I thought to ask you is, well, what about that person that has amazing social skills? Yeah. How, you or know, thinks they do. Or okay, thinks they so do. Can they still so gain insight from your book? Absolutely. I think that's a rhetorical absolutely. question. Absolutely. You know, people say, oh, I have the gift of gab. That's, that's a, I don't know if that's just a Midwestern phrase that I learned up north when I was growing up. Oh, I have the gift of gab. I'm good. Maybe you are really comfortable in social situations, but are the conversations that people engage in with you, are they mutually enjoyable? You're having a great time. But is the other person enjoying the conversation? I even asked that question in a small group discussion at an event where I spoke. And this woman, I said something about, um, I forgot, I even forgot what the question I asked, but she was totally, she said, I can talk to anybody. I am good. I feel totally comfortable. And it was clear she hadn't even heard the question. <laughs> And I forgot what the question is, so it must not have been that great of a question. But she completely missed the point of the question and was so convinced that she didn't have anything to learn there. Um, so I think the extroverts and the people who have that gift of gab can learn restraint and balance and respect. Um, I think the highly opinionated can learn that, you know, maybe others have opinions too and we should listen to what they are and become enlightened. Um, I think the incredibly shy people can realize that shyness is something that we can improve on and i use the analogy of you know if patty if me if i want to get better at push-ups what will i have to do more push-ups so shyness you can overcome introversion is more about how your battery is charged it's charged in solitude it's drained in social so that's just how you're wired so there's all kinds of concepts there that i think give us a little perspective but yeah it is intentionality and wanting to okay if we touch on a little bit of the networking topic from Absolutely. your previous book sure just out of curiosity let's let, maybe we start with the introvert you're god forbid at some party or you went to a wedding or you know some unavoidable situation let's but as long as you're there let's say you you know you're in a room full of strangers what Mm -hmm. What does someone do, whether they're thinking about networking or not, what does someone do to even just get into a conversation without all the awkward? Well, there's a couple of ways. One of my favorite ways is to find somebody else standing by themselves who appears to not know anybody or, or just looks like, <laughs> help, you know, have a help me sign across their forehead. I usually go up to that person. And honestly, I have met some of the coolest people because probably they're either an introvert or they got invited to this thing or they showed up at this thing and you know they weren't really quite sure that you know maybe they're not part of the group maybe not they're not super extroverted maybe they haven't had three martinis like everybody else or three cups of coffee um so i always go up to that person and and i just introduce myself hello i'm patty i get their name and i ask a question and the question i often ask is this is in the appendix in the back of the book. Um, how do you know the host or what brought you, what brought you here? How did you decide to come here? How do you know the host? At my son's wedding, there were a few people I didn't know. One older woman that I approached and asked her, you know, are you <laughs> friends of the bride or I'm the mother of the groom? And she introduced herself and I realized I know her. <laughs> it's been about 20 years, but I know her. So we had plenty to catch up on. It was delightful. And I think she felt kind of special. She knew the mother of the groom. Um, she was actually the date of the bride's grandma, grandfather. And she was, you know, she didn't know anybody. That's so I, fun. Made the, I made her day or night, whatever you want to call it. A second thing you can do is um, look for a group of people that seem to be um, 
having a good time, being friendly. Look for the friendly, scan the room. Look for the friend, friendliest group of people. Don't approach two people having an intense conversation or a very, you know, personal close conversation. That's not considered good manners, but you can approach a group and you just kind of work your way around the perimeter and hopefully they'll let you in. I, I usually try to get there right about the time they're laughing and I say something like, um, you know, I just missed the punchline, but this looks like a fun group of people. So <laughs> may I join you? It seems to work. Yeah, well, I've done that. And at the same time, tried to be really quick to bow out. Yes. As in, I'll let you two get back to it. And so they may invite mm -hmm. you. But if, if mm -hmm. I'm doing that interrupting, it's because I had a reason. Maybe it's even just to say hi because I'm leaving or... Right. Sure. But, but you two get back to it, meaning uh, I recognize that I was yes. the Budinsky here. Or I apologize for interrupting whatever you're talking about. Yeah, I I break the rule all the time because, yeah, if I'm in a room and that's the only time I can say hi, bye, or just wanted you to know I was here. Um, yeah, we, we do. We, we can bend those rules a little bit if we're gracious about it. What helps a conversation be memorable? I think that's different for for everybody. And, you know, I allow the reader the op of my book, the opportunity and, you know, people in my, in my workshops and my participants and presentations and that sort of thing, I allow them to talk about and define what a, a good conversation is for them. Some people like really lively, some people like hilarious conversations, some people like spiritual, meaningful, deep some people like to solve the world's problems. Um, some people just like to catch up on, you know, tell me about what's going on in your life. I think for me, a, among the meaningful conversations I've had are when I'm, say, at a conference and I have a conversation with a stranger and we almost instantly find some sort of common ground that is deeper than, oh, yeah, we both are writers or like... <laughs> I know I was at an event where there was a bulletin board where we could take a piece of advice that someone had written that had put on the bulletin board, but we could also write a piece of advice and put it on the bulletin board. And this other woman and I sat there talking about just the concept of this bulletin board, how cool that was. And well, which one did you pick? I got this one. Which one did you pick? Um, and you, they're face down when you pull them off the, it's almost like a fortune cookie. You pull them off the bulletin board. And we just talked about what a cool idea that was. And then we talked about the advice that we got and the advice that we shared. It was wonderful. Well, it's a killer party or event planning idea too, Isn't right it? there. <laughs> yeah. I loved it. How Great do you conversation starter? Well, we all have, how do you get out of one of those conversations? If you just happen to be, get into one of those with one of that, that person, you got that person of all the people yeah. in the room. Yeah. How am I getting stuck right here? Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be like, you know, that person. That person doesn't have to be like an evil person or, you know, an inconsiderate person. Sometimes it's just not the right person for you. Like, I am known totally to go to, a, go to a party and mingle around and I will stay in a conversation as long as it's, I'm still feeling like I'm getting ener energized and I'm off, able to offer something, <laughs> given an opportunity to say something, which I know some people find hard to believe like patty you ever have a hard time saying something <laughs> trust me i get cornered all the time so i keep moving around to a different convert and i keep trying things out so but what happens if you get stuck to that person who's there on a topic that's not interesting to you they're talking way too much they're pushing your buttons in any way they're being rude they're being contentious highly opinionated offensive even right the words please forgive me go a really long way. Please forgive me, followed by whatever excuse you want to use. It could be real or imagined. It could be, oh my gosh, look at the time. It's, it, I really need to make the most of my time here. And I promised myself I'd meet 10 other people. Or I see my friend over there. She looks abandoned. I promised her I wouldn't let that happen to her. I'm her wingman tonight. Uh, or you, you can just, you know, I'm late for my yoga class. I'm, you know, my baby goat training class, whatever it is. Make... And some people say, well, isn't that rude? Or, you know, if it's getting really bad, you can just walk away. And there are, there are people that say, isn't that rude? And my, my dear friend, Jan Goss, who was trained at the School of 
protocol in Washington said if if that person's dominating the conversation or being offensive in any way, who's really the rude one? You're protecting yourself. You have the right to protect yourself. You can also manage a conversation and change it by asking a question that's, you know, like, hey, I know we've covered this topic for, you know, a few minutes here. I'm wondering how you feel about fill in the blank, whatever. We can manage and shift conversations too. So you if know. you've, you know, I'm just was sitting here as you were describing that and I'm kind of mentally picturing the master Patty in a room doing <laughs> well, something like. you've seen me do this. Well, <laughs> you've probably seen me do this. But I'm better <laughs> at it now after doing this book. You know, well, you you first brought up the, the word spiritual and I, I'll just take this kind of to the heart level here for a second. I tend to think that at some level, I change the world by changing things inside of me, mm -hmm. right? However that happens with or without deity or whatever. But I think one of the things that I, and this is an honest question. This is not a lawyer question where I already know the answer in advance. <laughs> one of the things that I, one of the principles I live by is people will know my heart, right? Mm -hmm. If me getting out of a conversation is is legit. I want to go meet some other people or whatever that mm -hmm. ultimately I got to trust that, you know, I'm not just blowing smoke up their yin yang. Mm -hmm. I've got to, I, it's first got to be the real thing for me. But then, you know, for yeah. me, I tend to think relationally instead of transactionally. And we've all been mm -hmm. on the other end of that. Right. So I'm thinking, how can sure. I do this relationally? I'm, how can I get out of this conversation relationally instead of transactionally? Because we've all been on the other end of that where you felt like a number. Like, oh, oh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, you, you learned enough about me to figure out that I don't fit your ideal client pros profile and bam, you're gone. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm just a number and I was the wrong number. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there's a couple of levels there. I mean, I, what's, what's so wonderful about this conversation, Roger, is that I think I can tell when I'm talking, you're thinking of it's, you know, lighting up neurons in your head and you're doing the same thing for me, which I think makes it very memorable. Um, both my books begin with chapters on let's get to know ourselves. Let's do you mm. really know yourself. There's a, another fantastic book out on the market called Insight by Tasha Urich. And her, it's just fascinating. We think we know ourselves. A lot of people don't know themselves at all. They're kind of the person that they think the world expects them to be or wants them to be. And they just live as that person to make it easy on themselves. And we've all been there, I think, to a certain degree. But when you really get down and you know, knowing your heart, what is knowing what's going to feed your heart and what's going to hurt your heart or your psyche or, or whatever. But yeah, I mean, the transactional piece, a big thing I teach people is networking and conversation is certainly networking and conversation lead to sales because we get to know each other as humans and we do business with the people you know for this we do business with the people we know like and trust and how do we get there by just being humans um and i was on a podcast recently that was all about sales and we have to remember that even if a sale let's say we're in a business we, I, if i don't get a speaking client or i don't have somebody doesn't buy my book well they may run into someone somewhere down the road maybe two years from now that is a perfect fit for me and they'll hopefully if they remember me the person patty maybe they'll make that connection on my behalf um but yeah i think i love it when people are authentic and that never means i think sometimes the word authentic oh my gosh so many rabbit trails here i think the authentic piece has been misdefined by to mean that we just unload everything about us and we just show up um, in a slovenly, unkempt, you know, and I mean that metaphorically as well as, as physically, um, it, you, you still should try to show up as the best you, you can be in that moment for others. It's about others. It's not about you. Yeah. Any surprises along the way? Always. Oh my gosh. So many surprises. Well, here's the, here's the big one. The number one conversation skill is not talking. <laughs> again, back to the title, it's listening. And I know I have, I have work to do there. We all do. Probably 95% of us have some, you know, deficit in our ability to listen and listening is there's many different kinds. 
and it's a lot more difficult than talking. Talking is expressive. You're, you're unloading, you're venting, you're sharing. Whereas listening, like right now, you're listening to me talk, you're hearing my words, you're probably looking at my expressions, my body language, you know, what you can see. And you're processing what I'm saying, but you're also processing what was already going on in your head, plus the reaction to what I'm saying. So there's a lot happening. And so it is, it's like, you probably need to go eat a candy bar after this, <laughs> because your brain has been busy. We all, I think, think that we are better listeners than we are. I was in a class last summer, a spiritual formation slash pastoral counseling kind of class. And this is at the doctoral level, right? So I'm hanging out with a bunch of smart people who then we had to break off and do a listening exercise. And you were only to ask questions for that 10 minutes. And there was only a few questions you had like, a. this was not a, mm. this was, it was simply Here's one of, I think it was four questions and, you know, two of them were the common tell me more or that kind of thing. In the, great words, and the, by but the way. Tell me of, more. Tell me more. I know that. And that I just such, interrupted you. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Well, that's what you and I are just, just hanging out. Mm. But the self-revelation was in the process of going, not asking a, the next leading question or thinking about how to, oh, that makes me think of or or only asking questions for 10 minutes what mm -hmm. was damn hard yeah well there's, <laughs> and, there's layers of listening and i'm you like know, man the layers. i think i suck <laughs> no you probably didn't because it, you know i think that's part of being a good conversationalist is being at that at that level and i'll, I'll walk through what i can remember because i know it's in more detail um that i've written about it in more detail but but there's the level of the person that's not even listening to you Right. You're engaged. Let's say you're at a cocktail party and you're engaged in, a in <laughs> what you perceive to be what we hope to be a conversation. And you start talking and it's clear they're not listening because they keep interrupting or, or they're not responding to what you said. They're off on a different topic or interjecting something that doesn't have anything to do with what you were talking about. I, I, I have people in my life that do this and I just I just know that's how the conversation is going to go. So that's like the worst level. The next level is you're listening and formulating what you're going to say or ask next. A good conversationalist to keep a conversation going is certainly, you know, they have the right to do that. That's natural. That's really good. The next part is listening and, you know, maybe even confirming with the other person do you want me to comment here? Do you want me to Ooh, offer anything, you know, and, and that level can be, do you want me to comment? Do you want me to offer advice? Are you asking for advice? Or are you just wanting me to listen. And then there's the, a good friend of mine, Don Christian, who's the president and CEO of Concordia University, Texas here, great conversationalist, great leader. He calls it charismatic listening where you're doing what you were doing in your class, just listening. And, it, people are almost, and you know, paying attention to just keeping us, you know, a, not a bizarre stare, but a, you know, a nice gaze at the person and just letting them know you're hearing them. That lights up the part of our brain that enjoys brownies and cheesecake and a good steak and a, you know, juicy apple. It it, it lights up our pleasure centers, and that's why people pay therapists and need their pastors and need their clergy and counselors and we so seldom are heard at that level it's absolutely delicious yeah i just even as you were just describing that it just made me think of a distinction and this is a little bit of me thinking out loud so if this is in one of the chapters that i didn't get to you can assume i didn't get to the rest you know the latter part of the book <laughs> it's, it's fine <laughs> Well, you know, I, in one sense, I think many of us have heard the advice, you know, what you don't want to do is be listening so as to respond, right? The only reason I'm listening to you is to figure out how to get my two bits in there, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which is different than listening so that you know how to respond when what I'm doing is bringing a new level of curiosity to the table. Because yes. like the words tell me more, what I want to mm -hmm. do is look for that angle to go into that more deeply or listen yes, for a listening. clue like oh the way she yeah. just said that made me realize that she must have kids in her life 
then mm-hmm. one of them just got married. Oh, tell you're, me more. You're, you're interested. Ahead. You're curious as opposed to <laughs> doing what I've been doing, probably um, interrupting to pull the, the attention back to you. I mean, a huge part of social intelligence and social etiquette is remembering that it's about helping others feel good and comfortable in your presence, welcomed. You know, I'm interested. I'm, I want to hear about you. It's not just about us. And it's so easy to talk just about us. And I think when we're, it's, it's like the, the dog chasing his own tail. When we live alone or we don't have many friends and we finally get in a conversation with someone that we feel comfortable with, it's so compelling to try to unload every thought we've had for the last week or two weeks or however, however long it's been. So I, th- I think the problem is the problem of the isolation is creating the problem of, I have to tell, I have to talk about myself. Yeah. I, I think they're, they're kind of related to one another. I see it a lot. It's like, I, there's a, there's a lady at the gym that I know she doesn't have very many people to talk to and she's, she's got some issues for sure. <laughs> I have to, again, I have to set my boundaries with her, but to, to acknowledge her, I know makes her day. Walk but us through the structure to. of your book. Give us a the kind structure. of a, a, a okay. mental mental roadmap of what you're going to walk people through if they if they invest a yeah. little bit in Patty Denucci. Well, you know, I have the, the introduction and the preface and all that, and the story of the book, all that, which people are interested, which I think is kind of interesting personally. I think that's interesting because um, it was not it was not a straight road. It was not an easy road. Um, the first part is I. I try to let, for all the people that really don't want to have better conversations or think they don't want to, and their boss or someone has suggested they read the book, I give them a really good case for the benefits. And it's, it's not just about happiness or professional success. It's also about our creativity, our intelligence, innovation. Um, And then it's also, it is literally a matter of life and death. It's about our health and having a vibrant life. We have a higher chance of surviving a an injury, a surgery, or a serious illness if we feel like we have a supportive group of friends to help us. And and some of that's psychological and some of it's just like you have people around you that can help. So the survival and 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 vibrant aging, which I'm getting more and more interested in. (laughs) Aging well. By the day. Aging well is is important. So I try to sell them on the benefits of this is this is really we're wired for this. No matter who you think you are, shy, introvert, whatever, we're wired for this. This is this is how we survive. Um, the second part of the obstacles getting in the way. Um, I think we also talk about preparing to succeed, which is examining yourself, examining what is it that you want from your conversations, because it's hard to recognize that you're having a good conversation if you don't know what that looks, feels like, sounds like. What do you want to be talking about? Do you like books? Do you like kids? Do you like dogs? Do you like, you know, what are your interests? What do you want to, what are you curious about? What do you want to learn more about? What problems do you have that you'd like to solve? Um, and then we go into, you know, your, your conversation toolkit, which includes things like, and that's one of the free chapters that I have on my website, um, has a chapter out of that section. Things like learning about the importance of being positive, uh, the importance of thinking in terms of possibilities. Um, and, uh, then we go into, I think we go into listening, the importance of listening and then (laughs) the grand finale before the appendix that has all the great questions is an entire section on drainers and downers, which I had a blast writing because I think that's a frustration of a lot of people is "Ah, I want to talk to people, but what if, what if I, and, and we go through a spectrum of how to deal with them on one side of the spectrum, it's pure and simple avoidance. If you know that person is always going (laughs) to go there, just minimize contact. And then it goes all the way through being the really brave soul who, you know, has the person that works in your office that just is constantly complaining. Take that person to a two hour lunch, bring a notepad and just document every single gripe they have and let them feel heard and tell them this is a one-time thing. We're going to look at these problems. We're going to try to address the ones we can. Um, and that's it. And they've been heard. You've done your job. And then it's over. <laughs> and I literally know someone in NSA, I won't say who this person is, who literally did that and uh, turned an entire organization around by just hearing out the person who is constantly complaining. 
thinks that person had some valid points. They also understood what how they were sabotaging the organization with their constant negativity. And it, it just, so yeah. It's, you know, and th then we have we have a wonderful set of resources in the appendix and all that in there. Yeah, you actually have legit resources. Um, intentionalnetworker.com. I also yep. stuck your contact info up on the screen for those that are yes. watching as opposed to listening. But let me let me put an exclamation point behind that thing that I just said. Um, Patty is a pro, oh, and, thank you. and I'm. I'm not talking to you now. I'm talking <laughs> to the l listener. All right. I'm quite in, 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 <laughs> you, you just shut, shut skin your trap the glory for a second, of it all. <laughs> says the host. No, no, I'm serious. If there's one thing that you figure out quickly in, in National Speakers Association, besides the fact that, that it's legitimately one of the nicest group of people that I've ever had a chance to be a part of as an association, because you don't last as a professional speaker if you're a nincompoop. Because <laughs> word true. gets around too fast, particularly in a day of social media. But but Patty's level of preparedness, and be, just because I was prepping, I went to her website and downloaded her free stuff, and oh my gosh, it, we've all done that and know that we're going to end up on a list, and yet the challenges the crud they give you is crud mm -hmm. and patty's got legitimately legitimately good stuff there intentionalnetworker.com patty yeah. if someone comes to you and and is curious about you speaking training coaching consulting water skiing with their organization what what are the things that you ask them that they could be thinking about right now, if they're listening to us, what are those things that they might want to be thinking about mm -hmm. before they even call you? Yeah, I mean, I, I would encourage them to at least look at my website and see the way I address the issues, uh, you know, the, the topics of intentional, of networking and conversation, because it's not from an extrovert's point of view. It's, it's I think I understand the, the mind and the behavior and the psyche of the introvert, because like, that's half me also. Um, I, I think a huge thing too is what is it costing you or your organization to have people there? It might be yourself, it might be your group, it might be your team, to have people who aren't, they don't have social intelligence, they don't know how to look people in the eye and have a conversation. And, you know, this isn't just young people. I mean, a lot of young people are right. growing up in a world where they're used to staring at their phones and they know how to take a good selfie and all that kind of thing. But um, it can be, it can be all ages. It can be both genders. It can be in any industry, um, any profession. What's it costing you? And, you know, I say you can really get down to it and say it's costing you your life and your health, but there's more to it. It's costing your culture. It's costing, you know, what would it cost you because you didn't at least talk to me about how I can potentially help you and your group? Um, you know, and it might be the book. It might be the book. It might be my blog. It might be my free resources. I try to offer something for everybody. Sometimes it's just a conversation. Call me. Call me. Right. Send me an email. How can I help? Patty, are there any questions I should have asked you that I'm not that I haven't? What what should what should oh I have gosh. asked you? What's the most killer interviewer question you've ever gotten that I haven't asked you? Well, there was one person that asked me what I was like as a kid. <laughs> and it's interesting because I'm kind of getting becoming that person again. I, I loved writing. I loved learning. I loved art, which I started painting again during the pandemic. I loved helping people. I loved um, going to parties and putting on a show. Let's put on a show. You know, that's the speaker side of me. So, you know, I think that's the beautiful thing about you know, the, the journey of a lifetime is becoming who you truly are. And that was really fun to talk about that for a minute. But um, no, you did a great interview. And thank you for the compliments. I just, you know, when we talk about speaking and writing a book, you have to anticipate what all your naysayers are going to be thinking and saying. At least I tried to. And well, you've um, lived this a, a good I long time. I have lived this. Right. I know. I grew up in this. 
Yes. My yeah, if, if I'll just say it real quickly. My dad and my grandfather were the local Chevrolet dealers in this little town in Minnesota. And my grandfather started the business during the Depression, and he literally built the business one and sold cars one conversation at a time. So I was blessed that I grew up in an environment where it was important to have good social skills and and to be a good community citizen and to be kind and gracious and respectful to people. But not everybody grows up in that environment. So I, you know, it's one of those, I, I know it happened to you too. You, you realize what your purpose is in life. And this is my purpose. I feel it in my mitochondria that this is what I do. And I love it. It's just such a joy to help people, help the light go on for people. Patty, thank you so much. And, um, and if, for those of you that have stuck around with us, thank you for doing so. Of course, not a bad thing. Uh, if you subscribe to Virtual Venues YouTube channel or catch us on one of the social media places, intentionalnetworker.com for Patty Danucci, intentionalnetworker.com. And uh, we are really privileged to have somebody of this caliber and class join us for Thought Leader Conversations. And we will see you on the next version thereof.